Welcome to Moments with Marianne. We have a very special airing today, and I'm glad that we're spending this time together to talk about this very important topic. Now, just imagine the unthinkable happens. You're a parent, and your child comes to you and tells you that they've been sexually abused by someone in the home. As a parent protecting your child, you call the authorities, you go to the hospital, you file a report, you file for divorce but there's still no way to prepare for the nightmare that's about to unfold. Most would never suspect that entering family courts would further victimize their children and place them in custody of their perpetrators. This is what's happening to thousands of children nationwide, and most of us are completely unaware that it's happening. Today, Marley McLean's here to share her firsthand account and her story with us in her book, prosecuted but not silence. So let's welcome to the show, Mara Lee. Well, thank you, Marianne, and I'm so happy to be on your show. You do an incredible show, and I'm very happy and pleased to be on it. Oh, well, what a joy it is to have you back on the show. I know last time we had you on the show, we had a lot of people writing in because they had a lot of questions regarding not only your book, but this topic altogether. Yep, it's a, it's a major topic, and actually it's a topic that's going on right now in the United States with uh, immigration, pretty similar. Well, do you know, for our listeners that are kind of tuning in and that are new, why don't you share a little bit about your story um, so that they can kind of understand what that's all about? Absolutely. Um, I was involved in the court system over 25 years ago trying to protect my daughter from sexual abuse. Uh, by her father. This was back in the 80s, and I just thought the system would fall through and protect her. I had no clue what I was up against. So I ended up fighting in the system, and I had she had doctor's reports and police reports and um, top hospitals in the state of Colorado saying she was being sexually abused, plus she had told numerous people what was happening to her, and that's professionals as well. So she told doctors, policemen, psychologists, social workers, her teachers, preschool, everyone, her family and friends. And it wasn't um, a rote in nature. I mean, it was very um, something a child couldn't come up with and, and, and very detailed. So um, I thought, you know, the system would protect her. I was, neat, I was clueless. And so once the whole thing began, I started losing more and more time with my daughter. The more I went to court to fight to protect her, the more time I lost with my daughter. In fact, at one point, she was placed into foster care and taken out of my home, but we were divorced. So there was no reason in this earth to take her out of my home. I'm a good, loving mother. Uh, you know, I was a sole caretaker. I had full custody of her. Uh, no grounds to remove her from my home. And so that's where they brought in the parental alienation syndrome, that theory that is being used throughout the United States, PAS, or parental alienation. And so when a woman comes forward with sexual abuse allegations, that's you're being labeled as an alienator, and that's where all this started well, with this, alienation. Yeah, let's break this down a little bit. So this happens in family sure. court, right? So it's it's totally different. And why don't you explain some of the differences um, to us in regards to family court? Well, family court is an evidentiary hearing. It is not an evidentiary hearing, excuse me. And and criminal court, where these cases would belong, um, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So these cases don't even go to criminal court. They stay in family court as a custody matter when it's never been a custody matter. This is about abuse. So any time a child comes forward with abuse, especially when they're at a young age, um, then it should not be labeled as alienation or the fact that the courts won't look at it. It should go into criminal court. And that's why I said when you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, of course, in my case, it was very, it could have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt with all the doctors and the police reports, but it was already in family court. So the DA at that time, the DA, the district attorney said, let's see what that judge does. And if that judge takes that child away from you, we will step in to do something. And I did lose my daughter and he did not step in to do anything. And he believed my child, excuse me, he believed my child was being abused too. Okay, before we go any further, I'd like for you to take a moment and explain this one more time because I think people really get confused in how this is happening today. It's this horrible thing of how the court systems are set up. They're not able 
to really function in the way that is best needed for the child, what happens is, in, it, it, uh, you know, um, let me know if I have this incorrect, that if there's a criminal, um, kind of criminal history with the dad, that actually does not come into family court. That gets thrown out, right? Right. Well, what, what it is is they don't they don't look for evidence. They don't look for um, even domestic violence cases. A lot of these cases will be domestic violence, and the, and the judges throw out that information. That's not what's important to them. It's what's in the best interest of the child. Statute. That's what most most states carry is the best interest of the child. It's not about the safety of the child first. It's who is the better parent to nurture that relationship with the other parent. Obviously, if there's abuse going on, that parent is not going to nurture that relationship. So it's in a family court, and it's which parent is going to be a better parent. That's not what this is about. It's about abuse. So criminal court would be a better place. And yet criminal court, you would have to have a lot of evidence, but you would be better off in criminal court than family court with the way it's going right now. Okay, but and and fortunately, the court system, you know, even today, does not have that clear. There's, they haven't made any any changes, and that's why I think we're seeing a lot of women from the Me Too movement who are finally coming out, and you know, they've been coming out for years and years and years, and for some reason, because there's so many of them, they are being heard almost for the first time. Right, and that's what this is going to take. It, it's part of the Me Too movement. It's part of Time's Up Family Court, so to speak, because this is a time to listen. To, you know, I think, as I said to you, um, I think on the last time we spoke, is it's the last taboo. I mean, you didn't want to listen to these women who have been sexually assaulted, and now they're having to listen to that. They didn't want. They don't want to listen to domestic violence and that. That started back in you know, when the Baba Act was passed in 1994, I think it was. So here we are in 2018, and I don't believe we've gone very far at all. I don't believe women's equal rights are in there because if you can't protect your own children and you can't keep them safe, where do you stand? So we need the Me Too movement. We need all women to stand up for this because it's a whole other avenue of what's happening that most don't know this is going on. Now, what is the percentages about? I don't need the exact, but the percentages about um, that this is in regards to where we have a parent that's abusing a child. The percentage, it's, it's, there's two different, I, I said this before, but there's 70% of cases where there's contested custody cases and if the father wants the child, they are getting custody of those children. Now, in those types of cases where there's abuse going on, they are getting the children, especially sexually abuse. There's been studies done where they get up to 90% of the time they're getting the children. So women are kind of labeled as vindictive, hysterical, crazy. Um, you know, why would you bring this up? And so it's, it's much easier for a judge to sit on a bench and look at it as a woman as a vindictive ex-wife, crazy, whatever he wants to believe, than look at a father raping his own child, although we know the statistics are that it is within the family most sexual abuse is. It's not the boogeyman around the bush or behind a corner. It's within the family. So the stats are pretty high and not in the context of all divorces because when you look at that, those parents and those fathers and mothers are working to do what's best for their children and they don't get in the court system to fight and usually when you go into the court to fight it's about an abuse issue it can be emotional abuse physical abuse child abuse child sexual abuse you know it's not it's not the parent that's out there working to make this work okay well and so and now let's talk about the ps you know this this parent alienation syndrome and what this means and who who first came up with this? I'd love for you to share that. I'd be happy to. Um, actually, the man's name was Dr. Richard Gardner, and this was brought up in the mid-'80s, early-'80s, and he started a theory called parental alienation syndrome. Now, it's not approved by the American Medical Association nor the American Psychological Association. However, it's still being used to this day, and it's a really huge problem within our family courts. And what he stated, he, he self-published his book, and he said he gra graduated from com Columbia as a professor there. He never was. He did not graduate from Columbia. And he sent his book to every court in the nation, 
wherever he could get his book out as he self-published. And in his books, I mean, this is stated even when I went on CNN International News, from his books, um, we all have some pedophilia within us that makes little girls and little boys better sexual partners, that we need to have more pity for the pedophile than scorn. It makes you know them better sexual partners and just sick stuff. And you're thinking, oh, my God, here's this man pushing his ideas out there that's not scientifically proven in any way. And it's causing, it, what it does is it, if a man is an abuser, it's a perfect way for them to get custody or take that child because they, he uses their theory. He used to say, like even when I went on CNN, he said, gel these moms, gag these moms. Well, guess what's happening today? These moms are being gagged and gelled, and they're perfectly healthy, good, loving mothers. They could be you, Marianne. They could be those mothers out there, your sister, your aunt, that have, they're not drug addicts. They're not alcoholics. They have no no problems whatsoever just trying to protect their children. So this theory is really hurting our society as a whole. So when we talk about this, I mean, and you brought it up, but I know you. I mean, I know your work and I know you. And I know that this is in in regards to that small percentage of men or parents who are sexually abusing or abusing their children. And not all, you know, there are a lot of great dads out there, and we've talked about this before, a lot of great dads Mm -hmm. out there, and they are really kind of – not only supporting you, but kind of stepping up to say, you know what, this isn't okay. We need to make changes too. Oh, yeah, there are. Like um, I was recently at a battered mothers conference in New York and NOMAs, um, so they're against abuse and that kind of thing. And they're a very strong branch of men trying to help this cause and this issue. And lots of good men. I mean, I, I you know, as I said to you, Marianne, there's, there's wonderful fathers out there and good loving husbands, and that's wonderful. That's not who we're talking about here, and that is the problem. We have to start listening to the fact that not everybody's a good parent and and that we just don't give 50-50 custody just because they're a parent. I mean, you know, if you're an abuser, you lose that right. And the safety of the child comes first. It doesn't matter about either parent. Yeah. If that child is not safe and that child is being hurt, absolutely, you lose your right to that child. As it should be. As it should be. And I think that's one of the things that um, this is one part of our judicial system that really needs to have a shakeup. And I, you know, I almost would think that because I couldn't imagine, you know, a judge reading these, um, this text saying that pedophilia is okay and then using those same theories to go ahead and, um, you know, basically use that for court rulings. And I think I almost am, you know, like, you know, we'll kind of give them the courtesy of the doubt and say, well, maybe they haven't really researched this. This was just something that was passed around saying we need to start using this. And maybe it's time to start researching where this is coming from. Yeah, very much so. And I think that, you know, really a lot of this is coming from custody evaluators, and they're called PREs in some states and CFIs and others and custody evaluators. And they're taking on this theory, and they're the ones bringing it into the judges. And judges, you know, they're listening to them. They they don't have the real knowledge of what's going on anyway. So if you have a custody evaluator or a GAL, which is a guardian of item lawyer for the child, coming in and saying this is parental alienation, parental alienation syndrome. And a judge isn't well versed on it. He's listening to that person. And that's what's really causing a lot of problems. So it is not just the judges. This is training required to judges, lawyers, psychologists, social workers, everybody involved in the system for the safety of that child. They all need to understand this. And and not that these women are just you have, I mean, you would have to be crazy to make something like this up because absolutely you're going to lose your, you would lose your child, number one. And number two, you want to, you would go through hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees trying to protect your child. You know, I mean, you have to be crazy to go through all that. There's just no way you would put your, your child through something like that and yourself. So it's, it's time to believe the children. We've had that saying many, many years ago. It's time to believe the children. And the fact that these women, you know, they have to stand to a, a higher standard than men do. They really do when it comes to this. They are, they are criticized at a much higher standard. There's actually studies on that too. So, um, not just somebody 
saying, you know, making stuff up. There's very, it's um, 2% of false allegations. Um, that means 98% of these cases are true, and we're allowing children to go live with abusers. That's pretty bad. Well, let's let's talk about the PAS for a minute here. I know we've been covering this. Okay. So basically, I mean, because, again, I mean, people were just like, how is this even possible that this is happening in today's day and age? I mean, we should be so much more advanced than having these types of rulings. And I'd love for you to just kind of break down what PAS is. And it's it's really when you've got this parent that's protesting about about the health of the child, right? Right. So, so some say a parent comes in and they, and they believe their child's being abused. Mostly these cases, it's sexual abuse. That's like the worst one. So if there's sexual abuse, and mostly Gardner's theory was towards parental alienation syndrome was more about cases where there was sexual abuse. And so that's what's really hurting because in that regard, the children aren't being believed and the women that come forward with this are labeled, like I said earlier. And how do you get around it? I mean, it, as I said to you, there was a, an attorney I talked to here in Colorado last summer that was just getting kind of research done. And I just said, you know, well, you use PAS knowing that you shouldn't be using it? And he said, yes, of course, I'm going to use it if it's going to get my, the his person, the father, off. Well, that's shocking to me. I mean, I think there should be some type of standard there where you have to look out for the safety of the child. That should be their um, mark, too, just not just just you as a person or anybody in society, you're supposed to notify when something's going on with the child that you believe there's abuse going on and, and you should be the reporter of that. Why wouldn't an attorney, you know, say, no, I will not use that theory, you know, because it, it messes up the judges. It, they don't, they need a lot more training. That's all there is to it. And then there's the difference is, Marianne, is that PAS, parental alienation syndrome, is to do with sexual abuse mostly. It's been changed over the years, but really when they come in and use that theory, you can count on losing your child. But there is parental alienation. Those are two different terms, really, because there are parents that alienate. And that's totally different. When you alienate your child, that is abusive in a sense because you're emotionally abusing the child to keep it from the child from a good parent. But alienation, when there's abuse going on, that is not about alienation. That's about abuse, and they need to keep it completely out. This has nothing to do with alienation. Either way, PAS or parental alienation, it's not about alienation. This is about abuse. Absolutely, bottom line, if there's abuse, there's no alienation going on. Why would you alienate the parent is trying to protect the child. They say you're alienating. So say I'm going to just use the mother-father thing and, and the mother trying to protect your child because that's mostly what I deal with. But so the mother's trying to protect her child and she's labeled as an alienator. And the courts go in and alienate that mother completely from the child. What? That's just ludicrous. They're saying that's what's a, an abusive factor, yet they're doing the same thing. And they're not protecting the child on top of it. It's, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking that well, it still goes on. And we've had talks before in regards to just what happens to children when they are ripped from a supportive parent. Yes. I mean, you know, they, once again, we'll go back to studies, but a child that has, has been separated from that, you know, primary parent it's very damaging. That isn't just to do with the ACE research adverse childhood experiences, which I'll explain later, but, but all of that, separating a child like what's happening with the immigration right now, it's, it's terrible for a child. It's, it's brain trauma. That's what it causes. It causes PTSD. Um, later in life, lots and lots of health conditions. I mean, they have I can go on into it, but it's your brain, your biological system changes, your brain morph morphology ch changes. You, um, and that's where you have the adverse experiences, where you have PTSD, or you may have drug addiction, or alcohol, or, or uh, you know, like I said, heart disease. There's many, many things, anxiety disorders. When our society won't look at this issue and won't grab it and say, "Hey, we need to prevent this, we need to stop this," then we're causing just generations and generations of children being abused and generations of problems of health, health costs. This is huge health costs, about $500 billion a year. Yeah, later on down the line. And, and you know, it's it's something to really kind of think about. I mean, um, 
when I know you talk about this in your book, and it's your book is a very um, in some ways it's a very tough read, but it's it's your memoir up to you know a certain point in regards to just what you went through with your daughter through the the court and legal system. And at one point, based off of using PAS, they had actually removed you. Is that I remember you talking about right, that? Right. I I lost um, I lost my daughter at four and a half to the father. Um, as I said, I was a sole caretaker. Um, lots of evidence and reports of abuse. Um, you know, the top doctors at Child Advocacy and Protection Team from Children's Hospital wrote a letter to my judge, please contact us concerning the sexual abuse of this child, and he threw it out. Um, you can't even imagine going into court, and, I, and now I'm talking about my case, but I'm talking about thousands of these cases. I mean, I can't even tell you how many, and I get it. I hear it every day from women all across the United States and internationally. So what's really sad is that you go into court, you think the court's going to protect your child, and you are pretty much gagged. You're bank, you're forced into bankruptcy because you go through hundreds of thousands in legal fees, and those that don't have it, they don't even get into court, so they lose their children that way. And I ended up in supervised visits at the age when she was four and a half. And the reason was is two therapists known in the state of Colorado for siding with Richard Gardner's theory, PAS, took a document on a Monday morning with the docket full to a judge and stated that I had PAS. And I lost my child over the phone ex parte emergency hearing without even – I was in Washington, D.C. lobbying and trying to get help through Congress. And yet here I am. I lost my child over the phone due to PAS, a syndrome that's not even – you know, it's junk Even science, and I'm yeah, yeah, and so, and I lost her over the phone, and and I didn't see. I lost her for eight years, where I was treated as a hardened criminal, and got to see her one hour a week, supervised in an eight by ten foot room, and she wasn't allowed to tell me what was going on. Everything we said, she couldn't see my family or my friends. I have a beautiful family. I came from a great family. Um, you know, she couldn't come to our home. We're in a little tiny room, and she can't tell me anything. Now, it was it was the most horrendous. I tell people the hardest part, being in court, is horrific. I was in court for 10 years. And in that 10-year period, I was in court not for a day or a week. I was in for months at a time. And it's absolutely I, – I can't even begin to tell you how horr- horrifying it is. And a lot at the end, I ended up having to represent myself because I had no more monies to get through it. So I went pro se. And the hardest part was those supervised visits because I'm watching my daughter suffer tremendously. I'm watching her hair fall out. She goes into a trance-like state. Her eyes are gone. She's beautiful. I couldn't walk down the street without people stopping me to talk to her. Now I'm watching this child go uh, completely away from her body. And, you know, today she states that, you know, she's going through, she was dissociative. I got her back when she was 12 and a half, and at that point, she, she still had to go to her dad's. So I was not allowed to ever bring up the abuse again. All I did for those years, through those years through high school and junior high later, after I waited you know, years to get her and fought like crazy, but um, was to get her back to normal as much as I could and as healthy as I could. And today, she's still suffering from all this, and not just a little. It's been really, really difficult for her to get to. And dissociation is, I I was told many years ago that she was dissociative and be glad that she could dissociate because she wouldn't have survived, and I believe that's true. And the things I've written in my book coming out right now, the launch of this book, um, that she has told me recently are incredible things that will help everybody in the future. She's very bright and... um, I, I can't even, you know, I, I'd love to read that to you, but I, I won't take up the time. But it's it's really incredible what she's written. Well, she's, so, I know she's a it, brilliant young lady. And, it, you know, it breaks my heart, but it's very understandable that she's still in therapy today because of that separation with you and because of having to live with her father. Let me just read this to you, Marianne. I think I will read this. Sure. It's, it's pretty incredible. She says, um, let's see. I uh, she says she, her her deal in life is to make a difference for children someday. She recently sent me a message stating, "I went from a three or four year old where everything stopped. I could not access my being until now. I am back. I can't believe it. A four year old soul and a thirty year old body. She can dance, sing, swim. She studies humanity and travel the world, ending by her true love by the sea." 
Now she says right here, thank you for always being on the journey with me, my number one supporter. I am real and solid in my body that is all mine. I have not felt my body in so long. The texture of my skin makes me cry and the water on my scalp. Nor have I seen my own shadow constantly in motion. I stop for no one. I am a butterfly that disappears just as soon as you catch a glimpse. I'm deep into my spirituality and let go of all that I thought was my existence. I can now access all my powers that have been locked away for so long. There is nothing that can get in my way now as long as I listen to my voice. I lead it to the other side, Mom. Love you so much. Your baby is alive and feels the beauty of everything around her. She just made it had a major detour, but she is always who you knew. She is who you always knew she would be. It just took some time. You, she says, you are exactly who she picked to guide her in her life. Keep doing what you're doing. She needs you to keep fighting. I can't even read it. So anyway, there's more. But it's, it's killer. And this yeah. pain doesn't go away. You know, this pain is a living death. When you're dissociative like that, it's, it, it, I, I, there's so much more to it, and really that would be a psychologist to explain that side, but, but I have studied a lot. I had to to get, you know, help her through too. Well, that's absolutely heartbreaking. On that note, we are going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Marley McLean on her new book, Prosecuted But Not Silenced. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today speaking with Marley McLean on her new book, Prosecuted But Not Silence. So Marley, I mean, gosh, I... I applaud you. I mean, it takes a lot of just determination to get through all the things that you've gone through with your child. It must have been just such a heartbreaking experience for the both of you. I know you're helping a lot of moms who are going through the same thing. What are some of the similar characteristics that you're encountering? What's amazing is most of these cases, um, the moms end up not having a relationship with their child at all. They lose them completely. One of the moms that I went on CNN with, that international news program, she was on there with me. They did the two-part, my, my case and her, her case. She didn't have Richard Gardner in her case, but the theory is still there, like what's happening today. 
Richard Gardner's dead and he committed suicide, but he wasn't in her case. But I spoke to her not that long ago, and her kids are dead in her mind. She said, Marilee, you keep going. You go for me and my children. You keep them inside you, and you keep fighting, she said. But uh, she had to put it out of her mind that her kids are dead. That's how bad it is. And I have poems that mothers have written. They're just incredible. To lose a child through life, it's impossible to know that your child is still okay. To protect your child was your job, so you think you failed in every way. But your child is no longer with you. So still very young, you can't help but think there must have been more you could have done. And I can go on. The poem is incredible. That's what these women are doing. And and they, most of the ones that I know um, back in my day um, that lost their children never got their children back. And so I was one of the very few that did. And I believe my daughter and staying in those supervised visits and my daughter never let go and I never let go. And by staying in those, even though it was eight years of that, um, she knew I was still fighting for her, so she hung on. She told me, I fly to your house at night, Mommy, and I'm on the windowsill, but I'm always with you. And that's kind of what she said in this article, uh, the last part of my book that I just put in the new book, is um, how she was always with me. She never, ever let go. So that can happen, and it can go the other way, too, where you just have no contact with that child ever again. And it's just, it, it, to me, it's just amazing that that is how our court systems are operating today. And obviously, there needs to be more that's done. We need to write our congressmen and, and get involved, you know, in regards to... Oh, absolutely. Her. No, I was just going to say there's um, Resolution 72 out of California that they're writing, which is really a good bill that's pushing. And everybody that's listening here is to go to your senator and congressman and say, how can this be happening? Because it is. It, 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 it's rampant. And um, I'm not saying it's just a minor and this is just a few cases. I mean, we're talking thousands, 58,000 children. This study was done 10 to 12 years ago. 58,000 children a year are having to go live with their abuser. Now, we're not, that's not even, I, I believe it's way higher than that, and especially with the calls I get. So there has to be a way to go to your congressman, your representatives, and say, how can this be happening, and explain that it is happening. You know, read my book. My book is a case study of it. I, I wrote this book because I wasn't sure I'd survive what I was going through because I was in a domestic violence marriage or relationship, and um, I didn't really understand what that was back then because I wasn't beaten to a pulp, but I was emotionally and I was physically abused all, all too. But I thought being domestically abused meant having black eyes and stuff. I didn't really understand, and he was very abusive to me. But the real abuse came when he's raping my daughter and I can't protect her, and he'd have a smirk on his face like, what are you going to do about it? He knew he had the whole system in his hands. He you know, was very intelligent and had like, close to a genius IQ, and he would just make a mockery of the system. It's the narcissist, the psychopath, the sociopathic behaviors that our judges and our professionals really are not understanding when these cases come into court because that is what you're dealing with. And these women, as I said before to you, really need to be careful, young girls, who they marry because you get caught up in this, you're in it for life. You don't get out of it. Well, and I'm glad that you brought that up. What are some red flags that women or just people in general can look for in regards to the person that they're dating and possibly marrying? Well, you know, I looked at, I mean, that curse of control, that, um, you know, how, you know, being on you about the way you dress, controlling you as a person as a whole. That's huge. Um, and then, you know, obviously physical abuse, um, mental abuse is just as bad. I think emotional abuse is worse than physical abuse. I, I think that emotional abuse can take you to another level. I, because I deal with so many of these women on domestic violence issues, I mean, you, it is horrific what's going on. And I'm not saying there aren't women that abuse men out there because there are. And, and that re regard to emotional abuse and that kind of thing, maybe not physically as much because they're not as strong. But that goes on. But the percentages are, uh, it's outrageous what's going on. And so I you have to ask me your question again. I think I lost my train of thought, Marianne. <laughs> the red flags, that's okay, because I know it's a, it's a lot to cover. Well, there are here. lots of red flags. Yeah. And that's easy. That's easy for these, these young people to get on the Internet and look up domestic violence. It's out there everywhere. It's not like 
our day when you never saw this stuff and you never knew what you were up against. Do you see that? In a, in a man you're dating, and he's he's really controlling and and real jealous and all kinds of weird behaviors, controlling you and keeping you down, or watching your money, how you spend your money, or whatever you do, just to be normal. You need to run. You need to don't stop. Go. You know. I mean, pass go. You need to collect your two hundred and go because these guys don't stop. And then. Once it's a lot of the cases, like I said, are domestic violence cases that move into the abuse of the children. Because once these guys are an abuser, not do they go to rape a child because they were abuser to the woman, but they will abuse the children if they're abusive, and they do. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't stop with the the wife. I mean, obviously, there's some type of other abuse that's going on in the home if that's going on at all. I mean, it just doesn't. Right. And for kids to see that kind of abuse is abuse as well. And they show the damage that that does to children as well. Well, what are some things, what are some tips for moms that might be in this situation? Maybe they just found out that their child has been abused. What tips would you give them? I would say approach it very carefully and and make sure, do not talk to your child about it. I think that's really important and not because it's, okay to talk to your child about them hurting or whatever, but you don't want to be labeled as coaching for any reason. And even with my daughter, I just let her talk and tell me, and I listened, and then I let her know I'm fighting for her, of course, but I didn't talk to her about it. I let her tell me everything, and I think that's really important. So if you go to a professional, whether it's I, I would suggest you know a doctor's office if you think there's physical abuse going on there, and when you're asked, as a mother, well, what what is going on here? Say, if your child's old enough to talk and say, say, ask my child. That's what I did. I I said, ask my daughter, because they would have used it against me, saying the mother said. In all the reports, it will say the mother said. Well, the mother's saying what the child's saying. You just need to let your child do the talking. And if you, and obviously, if they're two, two and a half, three, they can. At least my daughter was very articulate, but most kids can get that out. And um, or even if they're showing it in another way. Um, like putting their tongue out and saying, my daddy does this. So there's ways to find that out. And I just think you have to be really prepared. You can't get hysterical, I mean, although you'll be labeled as hysteria. You can't be hysterical. You have to be really together, and you need to document everything. I mean, you write down everything, everything that child says. You keep documentation. And then I would say after you've gone to a doctor, usually a doctor will notify social services. I would really get the police involved before I would get social services involved to do an investigation. Um, I find that social services um, usually will unsubstantiate the abuse in most of these cases. And so when they don't substantiate it, you're, you're, you've gone nowhere. If you go to court and you've got social services unsubstantiating the abuse, you have nothing. So it's very important to have substantiated abuse and documentation and proof. And if you don't have proof, okay, so some of these cases won't have proof, um, I would not bring it up until I absolutely was positive what was going on with my child. Don't just go throw that out there and think, I think he's abusing her, whatever. I mean, you better have your ducks in a row and you better have proof. Yeah, you, you can't just say that. You actually have to have um, the backup that that's happening from the doctors and the therapists and, and other people. Mm-hmm. And even then, there's no guarantee that you won't be labeled PAS. PAS or alienating in any way. And the other thing is... Um, if you're in a domestic violence relationship, you better be documenting that too. As far as if you're hurt or you're hit or whatever, that needs to have a police report. That needs to have a doctor's report. You need to have that information there. I mean, don't plan a case against your ex, for God's sake. But if there's abuse going on, you better have your ducks in a row and you better understand what you're getting into because it is a nightmare. And um, more than likely, you know, you're, you want to get a good therapist, a child therapist that deals with domestic violence and child abuse, or if there's no domestic violence, just to deal with the child abuse. You want an attorney that absolutely has done child sexual abuse cases and parental alienation cases and domestic violence cases. I would question them. I mean, you know, I find today even, I tell the women, don't go in to an attorney and say, hey, you know, I need you to do this, this, and this. But you will need to educate them somewhat because they're not up to par on this stuff. They're really not. So, I mean, my book is a perfect example. 
and I'm not doing that to sell my book. But I, my book is a case study of what's happening with the research and the legal behind it. Read that book. Give it to your attorney. Give it to – have your, somebody give it to a judge. This needs to get out there. It needs to get out there to educate. And that's like, um, you know, even on the back, it's Bob Geffner, who is the head of IDAT, which is the Interpersonal Violence Against Abuse and Trauma. He's incredible. And he's done tons of studies and research. And, and he has this huge conference every year. And he said on my book, he says, you know, all, this is a riveting book that must be read by all those working in the field of domestic violence, child abuse, child trauma, so they can realize what is occurring today. And it's important to ensure all judges, attorneys, mental health professionals, medical personnel, child custody evaluators, and social workers are trained in the dynamics of such maltreatment. So there are no more epidemics of this kind of thing going on. And that's what really needs to happen. It's training. It's training, and it's hopefully to get out of the old traditional, I don't want to say patriarchal society, but really it's the same thing we're fighting in the Me Too and the Time's Up. This is what we're fighting. That's why we need all the women to back us and we need all the men to stand up because this is a nightmare. Well, and they also need to listen to the children regardless what age, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, too. Is children don't – I, I always go back to studies, but children don't lie. The studies will show that there's a very low percentage of a child lying about abuse. So where is your, your mark here? Go with the safety of the child first. That's that's all you have to do. I don't think that's that difficult. I think if every state fought for the safety of that child first at any level, that the safety is in, in problem, like we're going to have childhood trauma going on and we're going to have a society that's paying for that childhood trauma for the next 70 to 80 years, let's look at the trauma and let's look at the safety of the child. That's all we're asking. Well, and uh, your daughter was talking to you about this at two years old, right? Yeah, she was she was two and a half, and she was very articulate. And people, a lot of two and a half year olds wouldn't be like that. But she, um, she had an incredible vocabulary, and I worked with her when she was really young with her vocabulary and stuff. And she came out with it with the daycare provider and told her that was the first person she told, and then with me and a friend was here, and I was like shocked at what I was seeing. But hers was more demonstrating what her dad was doing to her, where she. Um, I don't really go into this because you can read it in my book, but she physically stated what her dad was doing to her and showed what was going on and took off her panties. So, I mean, it wasn't like she talked at that point. Later, she started talking and stating exactly what her dad was doing to her and stuff that, well, no child could come up with. I mean, it was that, that graphic. And um, still, the psychologist here in Denver, there were several, um, and she, it was Gail Adams, Dr. Gail Adams. She looked at it and goes, um, well, what is she saying? And I'm like, oh, my God, what is she saying? It was like already had made a mistake, so let's not um, go back on what we've done, you know, because they've already gone so far into this. Mm-hmm. She hasn't known that my child was being abused. Or, for instance, the DA looking me straight in the face, and I think, Gallagher, my God, you have – you have one-tenth evidence in cases that you prosecute. Why will you not prosecute this case? Because he had a, my book, The Black Big Binder, that I tell mothers to put together their legal documents in. And he said, merely, I believe your child's being abused. Let's just wait and see what that judge does. I had tons of news coverage on my case. And Seven News here in Colorado covered my case for weeks on end, and they did an incredible job. And CNN covered PAS, Parental Alienation Syndrome. Since there hasn't been anything with Richard Gardner on it, since back then, and and obviously he's dead now, but the fact is you have Gardner stating on that program, gel these moms, gag these moms. Really, you should gel these moms and gag these moms that are trying to protect their children? Wow. You know, I, it's, it's really interesting when people really understand what PS is about, just that this is a, a theory from one doctor. He never did a peer review. He just published something and sent it to every courtroom and asked them to start adopting it. And they did. And they did. They did. And heavily. But the difference is today, they know they're not supposed to be using that theory, so they will use it in different terms. They might say the mother's enmeshed in the child's life. 
um, a Munchauser by proxy, or they, they'll give you any other term they can give. They try not to use it too much, but they're using this. It's still there, just like the mother that was on CNN with me. Mm-hmm. She didn't have Richard Gardner in her case. The GAL on my case paid Richard well, Gardner in my case, so I have the Why don't you check explain there. that a little bit? Have... Why don't you explain that a little bit? Well, you didn't touch on that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard, but um, what it is is it doesn't have to be labeled with PAS or parental alienation anymore. They'll find other terms to use, but they're still alienating that parent out and of that had, child's life. And you had Dr. Gardner as he actually testified in your case. He, um, he he just talked to the GAL. My GAL paid him in my case. So I have the check in my book and stuff. And so she used him completely in my, my case. Um, that is what started my whole case on the wrong track right from the beginning. When they placed my daughter in foster care and they took her away from me, I went in to, for a supervised visit with the father. He was having a supervised visit. I met by this GAL. I'd never met her in my life. I didn't even know what a GAL was. And she had four things she wanted to discuss with me. She wanted to discuss separation counseling a psychological evaluation, um, parental alienation, something else. I can't even remember, parental alienation syndrome. Anyway, I thought, oh, I can deal with this. That was my first mistake, to think I could go in and sit down with social services and the GAL, with Doris Trular back then, and and, and just discuss, um, you know, the, what was going on here. And the father's in that room. And, and she would said to me, why would your daughter continue to say this if you weren't coaching her? I said, because maybe it's going on. And would you like to hear what she's saying? And I said it right in front of the father. And then, and then she just kind of looked at the floor. And then she said, um, I want you to go through separation counseling. I said, my God, I just spent two and a half years trying to get away from this man. He stopped me. He never left me alone. And now you want me to sit in the same room with him and discuss what's happening to my daughter? I, I couldn't even imagine. I, I didn't say all those things directly to her, but I was like in shock thinking, how could she want me to sit in the same room with a man that abused me, is now raping my daughter, which I never believed he would do, and now um, go sit in the same room and discuss it? I don't think so. And then a psychological evaluation, I said, good, maybe we'll get to the bottom of this. And she points her finger in my face. She's never met me. She points her finger in my face and says, and maybe we'll find out about you. And I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> I was shocked. And then before I even walked in that morning, they had a foster care home lined up. I'd never been away from my baby. I mean, he had very limited visitation, you know, so he had a few hours a week. He didn't even really want to be with her when she was a baby. That's part of the reason of the divorce. So it wasn't, you know, <laughs> and now all of a sudden he wants to be in her life. And this, this GAL said, has a foster care home lined up. And she goes, this, this child's going into foster care. I mean, she had no idea what was coming. Neither did I. I walked into another room. I laid my head down on a desk as if I had died. And I held it together because I knew if I showed I was emotionally inept anyway, although I wanted to scream my head off, they would say, look at her. She's inept. We have to take this child from her. It didn't matter what I did. They were going to take her anyway. They had it planned. And the social worker taps me on the shoulder real coldly and says, you can go say goodbye to your daughter now. And I got up, and I couldn't feel my legs. It was a mist around me. I couldn't hardly walk. I I, I honestly was in shock. I know I was. And I could hear their voices in the background going, look at her. Look at her. She can't handle it. She can't say goodbye to her daughter. And I just put my hand up the side and said, oh, yes, I can. And I went in. I said, honey, mommy has to go to work, and I'll see you soon. She knew we were going roller skating that day. Why would she not be with me? And I never cried in front of her because I wanted to help her stay strong. And I walked out and they had the police escort me out. <laughs> How amazing. Goodness. And I drove, oh, that was the, I drove to Dr. Baker's office, who was a psychologist in the case, who stated my daughter was being sexually abused. And that's what I said to the GAL. I said, have you read Dr. Baker's report? Can I just got the report from Baker the day before that says, yes, your daughter's being sexually abused. And she's been exposed to sexual stimuli. And now this woman's saying there's no abuse. And it's parental alienation syndrome. was something I'd never even heard in my entire life. I said, I had a great relationship with my own father. I wanted her to have a chance to have the same. I didn't know what they were talking about. In a nation, yeah. I love my dad. But I wanted him to be in her life. I had no idea. What the so it's, it's shocking. It, it was really kind of like they did this this kind of dragnet with you where they were just, you know, they had already decided what they were going to do, probably because you were doing a lot of, you know, it sounds like when this first happened, you were doing a lot of different um 
kind of protesting, maybe making, talking about no, this? No, 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 man, I didn't. I was very quiet. I stayed way in the background. I didn't do anything or come out with any kind of media or anything until after I lost her. I stayed there. I did every single thing they told me to do and jumped through every hoop they wanted me to jump through because I didn't believe the system could fail a child like this. So, no, I did everything they wanted me to do. What happened was, as I said, the father was very manipulative and controlling and I believe well, they a say a lot of sociopaths and, and, are, you know. And yeah, and he's very charismatic and charming. He was good looking, and in those days, you didn't want to believe you. You know, they believed it was the boogeyman behind the bush, not a father that would rape his own child. And I watched the social worker with him and the GAL. They just thought he walked on water. And when I, um, I remember seeing him in with my daughter that day because they had a visit with him and I'm watching him in there and I could see the social worker just smiling at him and thinking how great he is. And that GAO had been on the case for three months before she met me. So he'd been working here for three months and he worked the system. It wasn't just the system failing, but he did work the system. He worked everybody in the system. Mm-hmm. It sounds like that was his uh, one of his main goals there. And uh, you know, and it's interesting, you are helping women today that are going through the exact same thing you went 20 years ago, all that same thing. Yeah, it's shocking. Actually, 30 it is shocking. And I mean, the cries and the pleas for help are overwhelming. And honestly, I sometimes feel like I'm going to get sick because I just can't hear any more cases. I, I listen, and they think, when I spoke at the Battered Mothers Conference last month, it was like, when I get done, they all approach me. They're just like on to you because they see somebody that survived it. In their mind, I have survived and I'm incredible and I get up there and speak like I'm really together and blah, blah, blah. But really, my heart's still dying. Every time I hear a story, every time I hear another child's cry, every time another tells me another detail of exactly what I went through, it's reliving it in a sense. I have to really harden myself and listen and give them advice and good advice and careful advice. And not an attorney advice. I always make it very clear I'm not an attorney, but I'm very, I'm an expert in this. I have been in it for almost 30 years, really, 28 years. Had to become, so, you've had to become an expert in this. Yeah, I did. And I, and I don't think this is nothing I would have chosen for my life and, and my passion, but it is now because um, I think if I had been the only one, I would have thought, well, I just got in a crazy system that was crazy and whatever, but now, when you hear that, when I testify before Congress with 10 other mothers who are doctors and attorneys and from every walk of life, and I don't care where you're coming from, you're losing, and I have a rally at the Capitol, and women are coming in from all over the United States, and congressmen and senators, and I'm watching attorneys come in on this issue and going, wow, we're going to stop this in 1994, and nothing stopped, and I, I have thousands of phone calls since. And other organizations popping up all over with this going on? No, this is a crisis. It's an absolute crisis. Yeah, it really is. Well, and I know we've talked about different um, different things that women can do if they're looking at, you know, uh, possibly marrying somebody. Just your story, which is unfortunately the story of many parents, you know, many women across the U.S. are going through the exact same thing today. So we really need to write our congressmen and let them know that this is not okay and that they need to make a change in in this whole PAS as it is. You know, regardless if they use the language or not, when a child speaks up, they really need to, like how California is adopting, they really need to put the child first. That's You said it. You said all of it right there because it doesn't matter what you call it. The bottom line is the child comes first, and that is not happening. Well, and so where can people connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your book as well? Well, I I work with the Fight Back Foundation here in Colorado. It's fightbackfoundation.org or com.com. And there's my book is at my website, which is I always put my three W's in because it seems like it doesn't go there, but uh, is M-C, capital L-E-A-N.com. And I have a lot of information there for mothers. And um, that in itself will give you a lot of information of where you can go and what you can do. I just think my book is the most important tool. It will be difficult for you to read if you're a mom going through this, 
but give it to your therapist and give it to the people around you that are trying to help you so they see the bigger picture. Because by the time you get through this, um, you don't have the big picture. If you have it in front of you ahead of time and you're not blinded by it, uh, my help, it won't. It will help you get through this better. I mean, I was really blindsided, and most of these women still are, but they have the internet today, which I didn't. But they are communicating that way. So, yeah, there's lots of books out there. There's great books. There's um, Dr. Leora Rosen. There's Barry Goldstein and Mohanas. There's um, oh, there's lots of research. Joan Meyer's research is incredible, and that absolutely will lay out the facts that you're asking me right now that will show how many of these cases there are and what the percentages are where there's sexual abuse allegations and the children are going to the abuser. She has it documented. She worked on it for years. And that was done by the Justice Office. And the research done by Dr. Dan, Dan Saunders was done by the Justice Office, which shows the domestic violence and child abuse, how CFIs and judges are not trained in this. And oh, there's so much information. So there, mothers should be looking for this information. Yeah. And, and that way they can help train everyone around them because obviously – there, we're we're dealing with an antiquated system that's um, you know it's it's not taking the child's safety into consideration, and they're just looking to make sure that um, you know they, they want to ideally have both parents to have custody. And if it looks like one is pushing you know against that, then there's got to be something wrong with that person. And we need to take a, a stronger look at that and say you know what is the child saying and what does the medical evidence show. And secondly, Marianne, this 50-50 thing that all these states are passing, gosh, it looks great on paper, doesn't it? 50-50, father, mother, that's wonderful. And they're good mothers and good fathers. But if they're a parent that's hurting the child, abusing a child, they lost that 50%. Sorry, that door closed when you hurt that child. Yeah, there, that's there's got to be some way that and, these, the, the family court and the criminal court are actually more linked and communicating better than what they are. Or you have a separate court between family and criminal, but judges are trained on domestic violence and child abuse and probably the narcissist and psychopath and sociopath because there are women that are that too, and they're trained on it. And they are, then you have a jury trial, and, but then you have a jury that might not be trained in it. So I don't know. It's a difficult situation, but there are ways to do this. An adverse childhood experience, they've got to bring in that ACE study. And if they bring that into the schools and these kids are young, you know, there is a way to curb a lot of what's happening out here and to protect these children. There is a lot of ways. And to look at the brain trauma and the trauma to their brain that happens with this abuse that's going on. We have ways to prevent and we're not utilizing them. And our congressmen and our senators are not utilizing it. And, um, you know, this immigration thing is a, a minute part, but it touches off on our stuff that's going on because I have mothers writing me every day about this saying, why can't we hit the news media with this really hard right now? because that's how they feel. They're having their babies ripped from their arms, and, you know, they're U.S. citizens. And I'm not saying it's horrendous, it's inhumane, but the fact is it's inhumane to do what the courts do, inhumane to the nth degree. Without a doubt. Well, Marley, gosh, we could talk on this topic for some time. I think yes, we could. a great change that needs to take place here, and, and um, it's, I'm going to keep an eye on all the, the work that you're doing to move this discussion forward. You know, thank you so I much. I appreciate it. Hey, oh, gosh, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Marianne, thank you for your help, and thank you for getting us out there. And let's hope to get the rest of the media involved. So thank you. I really appreciate it, and I know all the other mothers and people out there that the children are suffering. Thank you, Marley. I'm glad that we were able to spend this time to talk about this very difficult topic. I think everyone needs to contact their congressmen and write them and let them know that this is not okay and that new laws need to go into effect to protecting children. Again, if you'd like more information on this topic or to view Marley's information, visit her website at marleymclean.com. Her book's available there and, of course, on Amazon and at Barnes & Noble. While we're at the end of our time today, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. 
Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.